Hi, I'm so sorry. Um, it's Patricia Young. I just wanted to hop on a little bit early to make sure that we were streaming and everything is live. If you are watching, can you give me a thumbs up or some kind of symbol and let me know that you hear me and that you can see me and that we are streaming live on the HS person, HS highly sensitive person HSP page, please. Is anybody here yet? I'm a little bit early. So, um, hey, Julie, thank you so much. Um, all right, so I don't want to start until 2 o'clock. I want to give everybody a chance to show up. Hey, Kim, how are you? Thank you for letting me know you can hear me. So the first two minutes is not going to be super exciting, but I do have a list of everything that people wanted to talk about. Got my notes above the camera, so um, if, you, if you see me moving my eyes, uh, that's why I'm looking at my notes. So my plan is to try and address as many of the questions that were answered in the poll. I also have a list of questions that people posted, and um, we will get going here in about another two minutes. Uh, I think that my enthusiasm, I just didn't want to have any hiccups and get on late. So can you guys tell me where you're from and if you have any questions or anything that you're interested in hearing about since we have a couple minutes and you're my early birds? All right. So, um, hi, Rachel. How are you? Nice to see you. Glad you can hear me. Um, it is just about two o'clock, so as soon as it hears, starts two o'clock, we will start on time. Um, <laughs> not so good with the dead air time and talking to myself. So Julie's from St. Louis. She's living in Springfield, Missouri now. Rachel's in Florida. All right, so you guys, it's a little bit later. It's about dinner time for y'all. Kim, you're in Florida. All right. Where in Florida are Rachel and Kim? Are you guys anywhere close together? Oh, Randall, you're in Florida too. All right. Okay, so hey, Julio, um, when you hop on, why don't you let us know where you're listening from and if you have any questions. And then since it's 2 o'clock now, I'm going to get started. So thank you for joining us. I'm Patricia Young. I work with highly sensitive people. And um, I'm from San Diego, California, and um, I get a little nervous, so you'll just have to bear with me, and I have some notes that I've written down. So my couple of disclaimers are, um, I'm really excited to be here. I get a little bit nervous, and I get um, really conscientious about wanting to provide accurate information, and sometimes I get a little overly focused, and I get really excited about sharing information. My intention is to make this as interactive as we can, with the delay in people responding, I'm not sure how it's going to go, so we'll just wing it. But if you have any questions, comments, um, please feel free to jump in at any time. I would love for this to be interactive. I don't know how that's going to work with the delay and the response, so we're just going to wing it and play it by ear. So um, the poll that I asked, the most popular questions that people wanted to hear is how to manage overwhelm, how to tame the gremlins in your head, are HSP strengths, our HSP struggles. Uh, Krista wanted to know how we manage in relationships. Um, the next one was, is how do we change the perception of HSPs? Hey, Cheryl, nice to see you. Uh, oh, Randall, okay, you're in Naples. Oh, Naples, Florida. I'm terrible at geography, so if I say the wrong thing, just give me lots of grace. Um, the next question that people wanted to talk about was questions, uh, what is self-compassion? how not to linger on a negative feeling or memory. That was, um, is it Potmai, P-A-T-M-A-I, Devera? And then Amal wanted to know how to control overthinking and jumping to conclusions. And Julie wanted to know, thanks Randall, Julie wanted to know how um, to balance the need for alone time with your partner's need, how to not feel guilty or feel like you're selfish. Um, so two things that I just want to start with is there's something that's called differential susceptibility, and it really took me a long time to figure this out. Also, I wanted to say Julie Rockridge is on the call, and she and I were at a retreat this last July at UC Santa Cruz, 
we were privileged enough to have Dr. Elaine Aaron present to us, and then she spent a couple of hours hanging out with us, just letting us answer questions. So she, um, we're all experts in being an HSP, just because I'm the one that's in front of the camera right now doesn't mean that I have more information than anybody else. So I really would love to hear what everybody has to say, and I want to also acknowledge that you know, Julie was there with Dr. Elaine Aaron, and she has a lot of expertise as well. I don't know the rest of you, I'm sure we all have a lot of expertise. So differential susceptibility talks about um, the HSPs tend to be more responsive to negative criticism and to positive feedback compared to non-HSPs. And the analogy that works for me is if you think about a dandelion and an orchid, that a dandelion can pop up in the middle of a parking lot, not get any water, it'll come through concrete. They don't take a lot of care, they pop up everywhere. That to me is a non-HSP. This is extreme, but just for the sake of illustration. So you've got your dandelion. Your HSPs are orchids, that they require a proper environment, proper care, certain amount of light, certain amount of water. You put um, an orchid in the right environment and they're gonna flourish and thrive. And it's the same thing as the HSP. So the reason why I wanted to start out with this today is because that's kind of the framework that we're gonna come back to when we talk about like, the first question that you guys wanted is, how do you manage overwhelm? Well, if you're an HSP and you're um, in an environment that doesn't support that, it's gonna be a lot harder. There are things that we can do, but um, being in the right environment and surrounded by people that work. So if you're an HSP, um, like for kids, they're very sensitive to criticism. An, HS, an HSC, highly sensitive child, often doesn't need to be um, reprimanded. And if you ask them what do they need to do to correct their behavior, I'm not talking about a young, young, young kid, but once they're verbal, they can often tell you. Same thing with an HSP, we tend to be so critical of ourselves that we can make that correction, you just have to bring it to our attention. So negatively, HSPs respond much stronger than a non-HSP. And on the positive side, that we also respond to positive responses, having time to process, having quiet, um, having people see our strengths instead of criticize what we're not doing, that in that environment, HSPs are gonna thrive and do so much better than non-HSPs. Um, okay, Miriam, you don't like videos. All right, no problem at all. You gotta figure out what works for you. Thank you for sharing, and um, I hope you find a way that works for you to get some information. So the first question is, is how to manage overwhelm. So I'd love to hear some ideas from you. Where are some areas that you're feeling overwhelmed and what are the things that work for you and what are the things that don't work for you? So Rachel says, I think that is self-awareness instead of self-criticism. So Rachel, can you say a little bit more about that? So what I'm wondering is, while I'm waiting, there's a delay in the response. What I'm wondering is, when we are aware of how we function and process, we, we change that from beating ourselves up about like, oh, I need time to do things or I need more downtime to knowing this is what I need and I'm okay with it. I'm wondering if that's what you're meaning, Rachel. And Julie says, this quote comes to mind. When a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. I love that. And I think, I mean, if I could post that on top of everything, because I, because what happens is our culture is really geared towards extroverts and non-HSPs. And there's so much negative language around sensitivity and thinking. I, you know, I call it the two. You're too analytical. You worry too much. You're too sensitive. You can't take a joke. You're too serious. And so, um, if I understand you, Rachel, what you're saying is, okay, so I'm, I'm sort of onto it, but not exactly. Um, so what, so we get this negative messaging and oftentimes because we don't know we're HSPs and we don't have the support, we end up taking that on in a negative way. I'm too sensitive, I'm too needy, I think too much, as opposed to owning that that's how we are. Yeah, I don't work well when I'm under pressure. I don't do well when people are standing over me. I do need time to process. I do respond to things in a strong emotional way. I am a deep thinker, I am a deep feeler. So um, 
if you're able to let me know, Rachel, what you meant, I, I really want to get it right. This is one of the disadvantages of not being able to have a face-to-face -face or an immediate feedback, and I, I do want to get it right. So um, going back to managing overwhelm, I think that when we own what it is that we need and we don't feel bad about it and we don't allow others to make us feel bad about it, it's a little bit easier to claim that space. Now, HSPs, because we're such deep processors and deep thinkers, we're taking in information all the time. We see things, we hear things, we smell things, we notice things that nobody else is aware of, or at least non-HSPs. That leads to overstimulation, over arousal. So some of the things that we can do is, when I was working um, in an institution, I have my own business now, but when I was working for an institution, I'd often go to the bathroom go into the bathroom just to get a couple minutes by myself. We take in 80% of um, information in the environment through our eyes. So one of the things that's really helpful is sometimes to just find a quiet place and close our eyes. That sort of gives us our, our nervous system a chance to regulate itself. The other thing that we can do is some deep breathing. Um, Rachel says, I can't think and listen at the same time. I totally get it, Rachel. I'm sure at all. I just want to be responsive and make sure that I'm getting what you're saying is right and um, no pressure at all. And it's not my intention to put anybody on the spot or to pressure anybody to respond. So um, I just get sensitive feeling like, oh, who wants to hear me talk for a whole hour? I, I would love to um, have this be as interactive as possible. And if we can't do that, then I'm totally fine. I just have the gremlin. Okay, so here's a good example. The gremlins in my head are saying like, who wants to hear you talk for a whole hour? Because you guys have a lot of great things to say and I would love to hear your expertise. So Cheryl is saying emotional regulation is important. Absolutely. So I'm having this chatter that's saying, who would want to listen to me for an hour? So what I do is I notice that's the gremlin. I know that when I'm doing new things, I tend, my gremlins come up. When I'm being vulnerable, my gremlins kind of come up. And so I can acknowledge it, you know, that that's what's going on because this is an environment that I'm okay sharing that. Naming things is really powerful and being able to say like, oh, my gremlins are up. And then I just kind of go, okay, thanks for sharing and I move on. And the chatter probably is still gonna be there. The volume gets turned down a little bit. But I think that when we either are in environments where we can't name it, we don't know how to, or we don't know how to manage it, Okay, Cheryl wants to hear about distress tolerance. I do want to hear what you have to say. So um, when we're in environments when we can't do that, what happens is it adds to that sense of overstimulation. So if I were talking to you and internally I'm processing like, oh my God, nobody's responding. People are getting overwhelmed. This was a stupid idea. Why did I decide to do this? I can't talk for an hour. People are going to get bored. Like if I had that going on and so I've got that whole dialogue going on, and I'm trying to keep presenting, chances are my concentration and my presentation are gonna start declining. And the overwhelm, I may start getting physical symptoms, my heart may start pounding, I may start losing my focus, because I'm not attending to what's going on. It's not always appropriate for us to be able to verbalize out loud what's going on, but even to acknowledge uh, internally, like, oh, my gremlins are up right now, what do I need to do to manage? In this case, I really wanna model what I do to manage when I'm uncomfortable. It happens a lot. And I, I think especially as HSPs, we've been so invalidated and so misunderstood. We're only 20% of the population. Um, Dr. Erin was saying in July that she's thinking that it may be as high as 30%. I haven't seen that come out anywhere yet. So I love to share information, but I haven't seen research that um, indicate that. And Donna's saying that crowds and people are overwhelming. Julie is saying, I thought it was really cool how you name the nervousness at the very beginning, too. I think that helps us to see your humanness, and I would think there's less room for shame to grab hold of you. Um, absolutely, Julie. And I, I, as, as HSPs, I think that we go into shame spirals a lot. And so what I've learned to do when it's safe is to name what's going on. I, I'm going to say this over and over and over, that there's so much power in naming things. Because what happens with shame is when we don't talk about it, that makes shame grow. And when we name shame and we call it out and we share it, shame loses its power. And 
that's one of the reasons why I have such strong feelings about modeling the things that I struggle with, because I don't see enough of it done. And how are we going to learn to do this if we don't see people doing it? So I want to go back up. Um, Cheryl was talking about emotional regulation and distress tolerance. So um, these are some of the ways that I manage distress tolerance. I often will do a lot of deep breathing in the moment when I'm finding myself getting overwhelmed. I have some spiritual beliefs. I'm not going to put that on anybody. If I need to, I often will, excuse me, um, I will call on my spiritual beliefs to just ask, like, please help guide me. Please show me what I need to do. Um, naming it. Naming, naming, naming is so important. And um, let me know if this is a helpful example or not. This is kind of the best way that I teach is by giving examples. So a colleague of mine just started a podcast and I listened to a couple of her podcasts. We're in a, I, ha I have a Facebook group to support this. I'm, I'm not promoting, I'm just sharing information. And um, I listened to a couple of her podcasts and I had some feedback and asked if she wanted feedback. And this is one of my strengths as an HSP is I really have a sense of kind of what works and what doesn't work. But it's sort of like the emperor has no clothes that everybody's saying the emperor looks great and I'm going, hey, the guy's butt naked. And um, I often am enthusiastic to share my feedback and it doesn't always go over really well. So I asked if she wanted feedback. I gave her feedback. Um, she's another HSP. It was, um, with what was going on with her, it was overwhelming. She said she'd take some time and get back to me. And so I said, you know, I'm having a little insecurity about giving you feedback. So once you have a chance to digest it, are you willing to just get back to me and tell me how that was receiving it? She said, sure. So a couple days have gone by and we haven't um, spoken. And so I've been having that, like, my fear is like, she's going to be mad at me. I'm a truth teller. That's what we HSPs are. We see things that nobody else does. And so um, I talk about what I see. And oftentimes people don't want to hear that. I, I think, um, you know, one of the skills that we learn is when do we say something and when do we not, and that we learn to use discretion, but that still doesn't always work. Even like, even in this situation with having her permission still doesn't mean that she's going to be able to manage it and she's not going to have a reaction. I think too, that as HSPs, we have a lot of wounds. And um, when we get into relationships with other people, they have wounds too. And then that comes up and that makes it hard. So let me finish my train of thought and then I'm going to um, look at the comments just so I can stay focused. So anyways, I, we talked this morning and, you know, just wanted to check in with her. And I said like, Hey, I'm kind of having this negative chatter that you're mad at me. And um, that may not be going on. You don't need to answer this. And she said, no, she's, you know, needing some time to sit with the feedback. So what really works for me is um, I like to name things. And she had said that she really had never heard anybody name that fear of you know, giving somebody feedback and then having fear. She said it was really helpful. And then we talked about how do we manage conflict in relationships and can this relationship tolerate conflict? And often when we're in relationship with other people, whether they're HSPs or not, everything goes along fine until there's conflict. And I've had a number of relationships that as soon as we hit conflict, the other person isn't able to tolerate it and it's been the end of the relationship. And even though in this situation, um, I didn't think that was going to happen. As soon as she let me know that she was fine with my feedback and the relationship is important, I got tearful because I care deeply about relationships. I care deeply about communication. And um, that's still a wound. My wounds, I think all of us have wounds, and I, I don't know that they ever fully heal. That doesn't mean that they run us and that they run our lives, but they're kind of there and they're fresh, and they will get triggered in situations like this. So let me jump over and look at the um, comments and see what I've missed. Okay, so Sh Cheryl um, is saying, I'm an HSP and live with PTSD, which is a confusing combination. It is. And I don't know if you're aware, but HSPs that grow up in environments that are supportive end up having really good outcomes. And it's the HSPs that end up having caregivers that are not responsive, non-HSPs, those are the folks that end up having a higher incidence of anxiety and depression. And then adding the PTSD on it makes it really confusing because many of the symptoms from uh, PTSD mirror the traits of an HSP. So I would think that, that would be really hard, Cheryl, and I'm really sorry. Um, hey, Helen, glad to see you. So Julie is saying in regards to naming negative emotions, 
Dan Siegel says, name it to tame it. I think that there is so much power in that. I think that when we can name what's going on, um, it just takes the power out of it. Um, are there any other questions or comments? I'm seeing this as a lot harder to have it be interactive. And if that's working for everybody, we can keep on this way. But um, I was kind of thinking that it would be able to be more interactive. And, and, and if it's not, I'm fine with that. I just really don't want it to end and have people feel like they had things that they wanted to say or people wanted to participate more. And maybe people are just enjoying um, watching and listening. So uh, let me know if if there's another direction that you guys want to take this. And I think I'm just going to move down the list. So we talked a little bit about how to tame the gremlins. Again, it's name it. You've got to name it and know that it's going on. It may not stop. And when we are doing new things, when we're in new situations, thank you, Rachel. Um, when we're in new situations, the gremlins are going to come up. I mean, it's just a natural thing. And so to be aware of that and to know what our patterns are, makes it a lot easier because the gremlins start coming up, we recognize, oh, this is what the chatter is, and we tend to have, um, <laughs> it's hard to look at comments and then I lose um, my train of focus, which is something I'm just gonna have to get used to. Um, so with naming it, I totally lost my train of thought, I'm not even gonna try and recover it. Okay, Julie says, without boundaries, that can become co codependency and or people pleasing. Can you say a little bit more about that, Julie? I mean, I hear what you're saying, um, but I'd love to hear you say a little bit more about that. Julia says she's enjoying it. Donna's talking about also chronic PTSD. Yeah, that's, um, I'm assuming the C is chronic. Um, yeah, having any type of PTSD is really gonna make it hard because our, oh, Julie said scroll up. Thank you, Julie. Um, so Julie says, uh, a thought that just came to my mind was that one of our strengths as HSPs is our ability to emotionally attune with others. Yeah, exactly. Uh, a number of, sorry, number of HSPs are also empaths. I'm not even going to touch on that today, but we do tune into what other people are feeling. And, I, and what I think you're saying, Julie, is let me know that we can take on that role of wanting to take care of people. I think we have such a a keen ability to know what other people are feeling and we know what people need and how to make them feel comfortable and that's part of what can be really draining is um, and and sometimes because that's what we were praised for growing up that that's where we get our sense of self-esteem from we have this deep thinking we've got these critical voices so it's not uncommon for many of us to feel like we're less than or to have kind of a negative commentary going all the time but We've always been really good at stepping in and helping people. People come to us with their problems. And so we learn how to do that really well. But, but it's possible that we don't check in with, is this how I want to be spending my time and energy? Is this a relationship where I'm constantly giving and the other person is taking? And so it leaves me feeling drained and depleted. Is this a relationship where I give and then the other person gives? And so like I kind of talk about our emotional bank. Like it fills up my bank. I fill up your bank. It's mutual. And so what I think you're saying, Julie, is um, uh, I'm just looking at your uh, comments. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, my ability to look at comments and keep my train of thought. <laughs> I get to do a lot of practicing. Um, and I'm glad to be human in front of you. So um, I need someone sitting here to remind me what I was saying. So, you know, we need to decide. Do we choose to spend our energy helping someone because we can figure out what they need? Or is this a time to allow them to have their experience? And I think especially as HSPs, there are times when what we want is for someone to just be with us, to validate what we're going through. We don't need to be fixed or changed. And that can be a real powerful gift that we can give other people. Um, so Donna was just throwing things in. Uh, Donna says most HSPs put more in. Yeah. And one of the things that often happens is it's not uncommon for HSPs to get into relationships with um, people that are more narcissistic or people that have more needs. Because again, it's kind of a match that if the HSP doesn't have a sense of what their strengths are and where, they're, where, they, where they end and the other person begins, meaning that they kind of know how much they want to give, 
that it's a great magnet for the two to get into relationship with each other. And if it's a narcissist or someone who likes to take a lot and the HSP gives, and if the HSP hasn't done a lot of their own work, that the narcissist will tell the HSP what's wrong with them and the HSP doesn't know better than to go like, yeah, no, thank you. So definitely. Okay, HSP strengths. We have a lot of strengths. Um, I think I think what I want to do, because this will lead to what our strengths are, I think learning to own the things that we struggle with, I think what can be one of the most healing things for HSPs is for us to get really comfortable with who we are and what our strengths are and the things that we struggle with. And when we become okay with that, then somebody else can say, you're too whatever. And we go like, yeah. But until we do that work, somebody says, you're so sensitive. We go like, no, I'm not. Um, you know, that people have no problem telling us what they think is wrong with us. And because we are so open and vulnerable and kind of show up in the world that way, I think our capacity to love and have deep, meaningful relationships is very deep. But it also means that if we open ourselves up for that, we also get more hurt. And um, a number of people, you know, tend to be what I call very, you know, like they armor up. So they kind of go around in the world and nothing's going to hurt them, but they also don't let a lot in. So one of the ways that um, Donna says, Moches, uh, Patricia says, yes. So um, what has been really helpful for me is using mindfulness. So having a really curious mind to just observe what goes on with me and to do it without judgment. And what I found was, you know, I'd be having very strong reactions to things and getting really upset about it. And I used to feel like there was something wrong with that. Now what I know is like, I have strong reactions to things and I don't shrug things off. And I tend to have pretty high expectations about most things and I tend to get disappointed a lot. And once I recognize that, when it happens, I'm just like, ah, oh, this is that thing again, like my high expectations and disappointments. Naming it, you know, observing it and naming it makes it so much easier. I can't control it, but when, when I was not able to name it, I would beat myself up for it. Like, why am I having such a big reaction again? How come I can't let this go? The way that we're wired is we have strong reactions to things. We think deeply about things. We process things. Somebody can, can label that as ruminating. I don't see any help in using negative labels about things. I really try and use words that are descriptive. We think about things a lot and our minds can be really busy. And so to honor that and know that's going on when there are times when we need to focus on other things, we can go like, my mind is busy, I'm having a hard time switching gears, to be gentle with ourselves. It's kind of like if you had a little child that was um, overly focused on something, you wouldn't tell them like, stop thinking about that, stop talking about it. You gently try and redirect them. It's the same thing we need to do with ourselves. So the things that we think are wrong with us I think when we start using that curiosity and we start owning it, then we become comfortable with it. We name it, we own it. And then if somebody says to me, like, you know, you don't let things go. You get your feelings hurt a lot. You, um, you have really high expectations. I'll be like, yep. <laughs> you know, there's no place for somebody to hurt my feelings. It's like, I know that about myself. So I think that that's one of the ways that we can take the things that we struggle with and we turn them into strengths. And if it means that you need to talk about it with other people, I think this group is a great place, you know, to start asking, like, do you guys experience this? Um, and I think because we tend to feel so alone and, you know, we're 20% of the population. So in general, if we're in a group of 10 people, two of us are going to be HSPs and eight, eight of us are not. So we tend to feel like we're the only ones. Oh, Patricia, you're here from Australia. It must be the middle of the night there. What time is it there, Patricia? Okay, I'm looking at the time. It's 2.26. We're not going to be able to get through all of this. Let me just move down and see what else. So Krista wanted to know about managing relationships. Um, I guess I'd want to know what is it that you'd want to manage in relationships. And I think this kind of combines with Julie's question, too, about how do you balance your need for alone time and your partner's needs without feeling selfish or, or guilty? I think, again, it's that same thing of that when we – own that this is what we need and we just see it as a basic need as opposed to it's something that's frivolous. 
I, th I think this is where the challenge is that we're so aware of little subtleties and the things that we need are not big things, but non-HSPs have a really hard time understanding why it's such a huge need for us, having time alone, having downtime. And again, I think that, um, so the chatter in my head is saying like, I don't want to sound like I'm shaming anybody. And I worry sometimes that I may not be as sensitive to where people are at in their growth process. Um, hey Pam, how are you? Um, and what Rachel said earlier about not wanting to use negative words. Yeah, I, I think how the language that we use for things, how we describe things, and it's so easy to use um, pathologizing negative words. And I think the more descriptive words that we can use, the more we're just using language to describe what goes on with us and we take the judgment out. So um, going back to, you know, what do we do in relationships? So my concern is that I may not always be as sensitive to where people are at in their relationships. And I, I try to be, but um, this is an area where I'm, I'm feeling concerned that I may not be as sensitive. But when we get clear on what it is that we need and we talk about it with our partner, and I think when we can also, you know, remind our partner what it is that they need, you know, everybody in a relationship has different needs and maybe they have needs to go out and socialize or to go to sporting events or, I don't know, I, my mind is kind of coming up blank, that those are valid needs for them. We don't necessarily have to do those things with our partner. We can negotiate what is doable and what's not. A big thing that I do on a number of people that I know is we take separate cars when we go to events so that I can go and get my time in and when I'm done I can leave and then my partner can stay and you know visit and get his needs met as much as he needs and that it helps me to go when I need to go. So hey Pam from uh, Washington and Nicole from North Carolina. Um, so I don't think that answers your question exactly Julie. Do you want to give more information about that? And and is it that um, is it that your partners give you a hard time about your needs? Because I don't know. I don't. I don't want to get into dangerous territory here, and it feels dangerous making assumptions. Um, there's a movie called Sensitive that Dr. Elaine Aaron and Alanis Morissette are in. I just watched it last night. You can stream it on on Amazon. Has anybody watched that? And if you have, what did you think about it? Um, because they had an example there and it's funny I watched it with my husband and he felt like the example was way over the top and I said mm, no and the situation was a uh, um, I'm assuming it was a husband and wife a man and woman coming home from what appeared to be a sporting event and you could see that she was just overstimulated over aroused getting ready to shut down and you could tell that he was feeling irritated and the conversation that went on between them was you know he was like how come you can't go and do things and she's like I, you know and he's like and even like my keys jangling bother you. And he like shakes, here I do. He shakes the keys in front of her face. And like, I just kind of recoiled from that. And it was really an illustration of how a non HSP just had no clue as to how overwhelming and overstimulating that was. And that goes back to Donna talking about crowds, you know, lots of people, that's lots of sight, smell, sound. That is a lot for us. And our nervous systems are so sensitive. And um, it was interesting because my husband felt that that was a really over the top reaction. I'm like, no, it's it's not. I think it's really common. And how do we educate our friends and partners and family members that are non HSPs to understand what our sensitivities are? And how do we own that in a way that we own it as opposed to feeling apologetic? Because I think we tend to feel like it's not OK. And then that gives um, other people uh, sometimes the ability to to treat us in a way that it's not okay as opposed to like mm, this is what's going to work and this isn't so julie says sometimes my partner takes it personally when i express my need for alone time i struggle with owning my need for solitude and tend to be hyper aware of her needs instead yeah and that's kind of a boundary thing that um you know oftentimes like we close the door because we need that space inside but if it hits another person's Julie, I don't know if this fits for you, and I'm not making assumptions about your um, relationship, but this is something I experienced in my family, that the person who's on the outside of the doors feels like they're being shut out. And so that's kind of a boundary thing that we kind of have competing needs. So the HSP is needing time alone, and the non-HSP is feeling hurt or angry or upset because they're feeling like they're being shut out. And that can also be... Um, 
you know, extroverts who need that sense of connection and want that engagement. And for HSPs, we kind of hit a limit and then we need to have a little bit of our own time. And so how do you negotiate that and how, you know, who gets their needs met? And I have two kids that, although they won't say that they're highly sensitive, they have some pretty strong sensitivities in the, and they're twins, they're boys. So the rule in our house was whoever needs the most space gets it. And um, as kids, we had to put them in separate rooms because one of them would literally sit and stand and walk all over the other one. And that didn't go over very well. So um, Julie said, learning that I'm an HSP has helped me a lot to be able to feel that my needs are valid. And Tricia says, agree, Julie. And Rachel says she relates to Julie. So it sounds like this is a really big thing of how do you negotiate with your partner um, when you have needs and your partner doesn't get it. That, that is a really tough one. Um, so what have you guys found that's been successful? How do you manage your own guilt when this comes up? And how comfortable do you feel? Um, you know, because there are a couple of things. Is your partner understanding and how comfortable are you feeling with your needs? And I'm not trying to put anybody on the spot and I'm not saying that it, the fault or the responsibility lies anywhere, but I see it as being a combination of the two. Um, I think too, as HSPs, we have the sense of being too much, being too needy, whether it's needing too much alone time or too much solitude. I think we tend to feel that who we are in our relationships is not okay. And I think that goes back to um, the initial wounding that we have. And that's gonna show up, especially in our intimate relationships. And often no matter how much we talk about it, it still continues to come up. Um, any more about, I, I feel like this is a big topic and I think there's more that you guys have to say, but I'm not sure where to go with it without being able to talk with you more directly. So it's 2.34. Um, so let's move down. If you guys have some comments, we can come back and visit this. My sense is that this is a big, big, big topic. Um, I'm throwing something out there without knowing if this is something that's going to work or something that we want to do. So just kind of know that this is a thought I was thinking earlier today. Um, so Donna says, my partner feels comfortable when I have to go to another room. I have to. Yeah, I, I think it really depends on our partners, what our history is, what our wounding is, where we're at. I think sometimes my husband is <laughs> my husband's happy when I go to the other room because he can watch sports. He likes to have the TV on all the time. And, you know, I feel bad. He watches sports muted most of the time because I hate having the TV on. And he doesn't want to get wireless headphones because he doesn't want to feel isolated from everybody. But, like, I leave and go in the other room. So, <laughs> you know, isn't that more isolating than being in there with headphones on? So, you know, all I can do is laugh at the things that we struggle with. But I think everybody has certain struggles in a relationship, no matter who you are or what the, what the situation is. Um. I totally lost my train of thought. I was going to go somewhere with this and I can't remember what it was. Um, so changing the perception of HSPs, I think as we, um, as we become more comfortable with who we are and what, oh, so I got it. <laughs> I feel like a squirrel. Oh, squirrel. <laughs> um, so what I was thinking earlier today is um, there's a chance, no guarantees, no promises, but um, we might be able to do a Zoom call. And that way I need to see with the Zoom that I have, how many people could get on, but then it's face to face and it's kind of nice. You can kind of set it up so it looks like Brady Bunch style because I really would much rather have this be interactive. You guys have so much to offer and I'm really not able to hear specifically what your concerns are. And I really, my vision for this was really to have you guys talk about what works for you, what you struggle with and to have a dialogue between everybody and not having done this before, you know, so we learned that this isn't, so great for having interaction and you know I don't know if you guys would want more interaction or how that sounds to you oh Rachel says that would be great and um, yeah so that's something that we can certainly explore okay so negative perceptions of HSPs I think as we feel better about ourselves um, having information having education is so important my guess is everybody's read Elaine Aaron's book. Her website is great, hsperson.com. She's got lots of videos on YouTube. Ted Zeth has some great books. Julie B. Elland, B J E L L A N D. I don't get anything if you guys look at this stuff. Like I don't, I'm, I'm not endorsing anything. Um, I'm a little jumpy and nervous. 
Um, Julie Bieland has a book on brain training for HSPs, and I think she has an online course. I think the more that we learn about our trait and about us, the more we become confident in it, and the more we can recognize when some of this is, it's the equivalent of kind of fat shaming that goes on, but it's with sensitivity. And um, I watch America's Got Talent, and I don't know if anybody watches it, but um, Oral, I'm gonna read your comment in a minute, otherwise I'm gonna lose my train of thought again, and you know what it's like for me to get it back. So America's Got Talent, they had two young boys that were singers, I don't know, they were between nine and 13, and they got eliminated, and Heidi Klum says to them, you guys are handling it just like men. And I, I thought, are you effing kidding me? I, I kind of flipped a gasket when that happened. I'm thinking, these kids had dreams of being, you know, winning a million dollars and going further. They're, you know, young kids, preteens, they just got their heart broken because they were eliminated. You should be feeling disappointed. You should be feeling hurt. And if you're shedding tears, that's okay. Not all creatives are HSPs, but a number of creatives, artists, singers, poets, are HSPs. And the message that Heidi gave you know, to all of America is, suck it up and don't have feelings. That's how you act like a man. It was a very small comment. This is exactly what I'm talking about, the negative messaging and how powerful it is and how very subtle. She just said, like, you guys are taking it like men. How damaging was that? Okay, I'm getting off my soapbox. All right, so Oral said, is it a possibility that whenever I recognize a change in behavior in other people, that I often start experiencing those feelings that they are having myself? Could this have to do with being an HSP? Sorry if my question isn't clear, my main language is in English. Um, Julie, I would love to hear your answer on this and anybody else, I just don't know you guys, so um, if I'm not calling on you, forgive me. What I'm wondering is if um, there are two things, and, and I don't, I can't speak too much to empaths. HSPs are very aware of what other people are feeling. We have a sense of what other people need. We take on other people's feelings and emotions. Now there are empaths, and I, I don't know an awful lot about empaths, but empaths kind of absorb the energy of other people. I don't have enough skill to be able to tell you where the difference is and exactly what empaths do, but empath is E-M-P-A-T-H, and so I'm wondering if that's not what you're speaking of. Um, Julie says, yes, I often feel like I'm very sensitive to the moods of those things around me. I think it's the HSP thing. Uh, Rachel says, perception versus projection. So perception is what we're taking in, what we're perceiving, and we're very discriminating on what we take in, and projection is what we can't um, own for ourselves, so we something that we're feeling, so we put it on somebody else. If I'm if I'm mad at you, but I can't own my feelings, I'm going to say, "Are you mad at me? Or you seem mad?" <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, it, Oral, it sounds like uh, Randall Randall saying, "Yes, look into mirror neurons and HSPs." And somebody correct me, like this is where I get a little nervous. I'm I'm not a research person, and I want to report information accurately, but this isn't an area where I, I understand as much. And so um, if I say this incorrectly, somebody please jump in and correct me. My understanding is that HSPs have more mirror neurons. So that means that when things are going on in the environment, we pick up on it and we respond and our brain fires more than a non-HSP. I feel that's, that's my kindergarten answer to it. Can somebody add a little bit more to that? So Oral, it sounds like um, you want to look at mirror neurons also and then maybe look into empaths. Randall, are you able to add any more information or can somebody else talk a little bit more about mirror neurons? Because that's not my area of expertise. Okay, Randall may be responding, there may be a delay, we don't know. Julie says, this is an ongoing area of growth in my relationship. I'm working on having internal boundaries so that I can allow myself to be in a good mood even when my partner is having a bad day. We are two different people, and while I want to empathize with her and offer her kindness, I don't want to fall apart and fall into a depression with her. I think that's really common. I think it's so hard to, um, well, I think because of our um, empathic nature and we feel things so strongly that I think that pull is there to really want to provide comfort and nurturing and helping to other people. And just what Julie says, that 
we need to find ways to allow other people to be in the space that they're at, to be able to interact with them, but to not allow that to impact us and to, to pull us into a space that we're not in. Like, if you're feeling sad and I'm sad, we can be sad together. But if you're sad and I'm not sad and then I get sad, that's hard. Okay, so um, Donna says, Randy can, uh, so I think that's okay. So Randall's talking about correct, uh, this is, so we're, we're jumping all over. We're back to mirror neurons. So Randall says correct, and we can observe behavior and experience the exact same feeling through our mirror neurons. And Rachel says yes. So, um, so yeah, so we can be around somebody and have them experience something, and because of our mirror neurons, we end up feeling the same thing because of our high um, high sensitivity isn't the best word. I, I don't have the language for it because the way our brains are wired. Oral says, thanks for your answer. It's weird, but whenever people are happy, I'm happy. But when other others are angry, I'm angry myself as well. I feel like I pick up every detail and change in behavior. I try to keep it cool, but there's just a point where the emotion feels too intense and I just snap. Um, and so Oral says, thanks, Randall. I'll look into that. Yeah. Um, I, I think that we are strongly impacted by other emotions that are in the environment. Uh, Randall says that's why we yawn. Um, so, Randall, are you saying as far as that's how we self-regulate by yawning? Because that's my experience. If I get overstimulated or overwhelmed or too many emotions, I yawn, and I know for me that that's a way that I self-regulate. So I kind of want to see what Randall says. I want real live time interaction, though, this waiting for people to respond. Not so great for me, but I can manage my distress tolerance. Okay, I'm gonna move on and wait for Randall to respond. Um, how to control overthinking and jumping to conclusions. Brene Brown talks about the stories that we make up in our head, and I love this. This is something that I use all the time. And um, our minds are always gonna be busy. <laughs> I was just talking to my husband the other night. I feel like I'm one of those dogs that if you don't give me a good bone to chew on, I'm going to dig up holes in your backyard and I'm going to chew up your furniture. And the context that this was is um, I'm working on some, uh, so Randall says, we observe a yawn and it activates our mirror neurons. Uh, and Donna says he did. Okay. Um, I'm just looking to see if I missed something. Okay. All right. Um, so. <laughs> Squirrel, getting back on track. Um, I have a little thought and I just totally lost it. That's okay. Um, how to control? Okay, so the story that we make up in our heads. So it's so easy for us to not have information, and because we're so sensitive, this is something that's really important. Um, we pick up on things. So we may say something, and somebody has a very slight reaction. And we pick up on it, the person may not even be aware of it. This happens with my husband all the time. So I see this reaction and I ask him, he's, goes, he's like, nothing. So it's easy for us to make up a story in our head. And what, this is kind of a silly example, but I think it's easy that we could get together with someone and you know they're acting weird. And so we make up a story, they're mad at us, they don't like something we said, they're disappointed, whatever our history is in the story that we make up, they could have indigestion. That could be what we're picking up on, but we make up a story about it. So I think um, our brains are always gonna be busy. They're gonna be active. That's just kind of the nature of things, and we know that. So um, back to my train of thought about the dog with the bone and digging holes in the, in the yard or um, chewing up your furniture, that because many of us have really active minds, it means that we need to find stuff that we can land on that keep us in, um, a calmer place and for me I listen to a lot of podcasts for some people it's listening to music for some people it's having lots of meditation time that I think um, especially when we have a lot of wounding and we haven't had a chance to work on it or we're going through change or new things I, I think that um, you know I have a history of trauma so I, I can't speak as much for people for HSPs that don't you know that had really uh, good mirroring growing up but I think that we tend to go to a fearful, anxious place in our thinking. We just kind of do. And um, often have uh, kind of morbid thoughts about things. And I just know that I do and I kind of notice them and then I move on. So um, I'm trying to pull my thought back together. My, uh, my little dog is on my lap. This is Gracie, the one I'd wonder. And she saw a dog outside and started to get riled up. So I was trying to calm her in. 
you know me and my attention span. Um, so it's easy for us to jump to conclusions about things and to make up stories in our head. And we, we do pick up on something and the person may not even be aware of what that is. So that's where it's really important for us to wait until we have evidence or information or get a reality check. And often I tell myself, you know, if it's somebody that I'm close enough to, I tell them this is a story I'm making up in my head and I ask for a reality check. We can't always do that with everybody. That's not appropriate in all situations. But sometimes we just need to wait until we have evidence that, you know, justifies what we're thinking. But to be aware of, I think that it's very common for us to jump to a conclusion before we really have enough evidence. And we may be responding to something that we see, but we don't know that that's really what the story is. So Julie says, I love Brene Brown's tool of talking about the stories we make up in our heads. She talks about it in this article. And so um, Julie posted the article. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, also, if you're interested, uh, Brene Brown has some great talks on YouTube about vulnerability and shame. If you're not familiar with her, I love her stuff. She also on her website has a great um, animated uh, piece about empathy. And it's really about how empathy isn't about, you know, standing with somebody in the hole of like, how are you doing down there? What do you need? It means you get in the hole with a person and you sit with them. Um, uh, Oral said morbid thoughts. Yep. Very relatable. I know my husband totally doesn't get it, so I've just learned to not share my morbid thoughts with him because it just <laughs> it just freaks him out. And it's interesting because he doesn't identify as being an HSP. We were talking about this last night, but I see areas where he's highly sensitive and you know where he just can't tolerate certain things. Um, okay, so we talked about uh, overthinking, jumping to conclusions. We talked about balance our need for alone time. So I think that we have covered all of the questions. It's 2.49. Is there anything else before we wrap this up and go? Any questions? Uh, this is Gracie. <laughs> and this is what Gracie does. She wants me to pet her, so she leans back. OK. So um, Julie says that happens all the time with my partner. I'll notice a change in her mood or a change in her facial expression. And so I'll ask her, what are you thinking? Or are you OK? And she'll say nothing. So I make up a story. I think too, Julie, I, I think um, I'm assuming that your partner's an HSP. I think sometimes they don't even know. And, you know, that's again where we pick up on stuff. And that's where it can be really crazy making because we're seeing and perceiving things. And the other person, I don't think it's that they know and they're hiding it from us. I don't think that they even know. It happens with my husband a lot. <laughs> um, Donna says, um, PM me all the books uh, so I can uh, put them in the files. I will do that. Oral says, actually feels really good hearing this. I've been very anxious about the stories I made up in my head. I know, I know, we, we do that. <laughs> and, and the morbid death thoughts. I have a friend who, it's, it's really, it's just comforting because we can tell each other like, I have this terrible thought today, yeah, so did I. <laughs> so, and you know, I think that the blessing is that um, and Elaine Aaron says, like, we need to connect with other HSPs. Like, that's what we need to do for our healing and our growth, because then we can laugh about it instead of this thing of like, oh, my God, I'm having these terrible thoughts. We just know everybody has them. It's like, it's just kind of how we are. Um, so Julie says, true, very true. Patricia says she definitely can relate. Julia says, do you see yourself as an introvert or an extrovert uh, in good video? I thought I was an introvert. Um, I had a lot of social anxiety. I still don't like um, meeting new people. I don't like going to parties. I kind of have a narrative of my in my head of like, I have nothing to say. I, you know, I, I don't like new things. Uh, they make me pretty anxious. And because I would get so overwhelmed and need to pull back, I thought I was an introvert. And just this last July, I learned I'm an extrovert, but I'm a highly sensitive extrovert. So what that means is still don't like big crowds, you know, that means for me um, being in a small group. And I thought because I get overwhelmed and overstimulated, I would withdraw thinking that's what I needed to recharge because that's what introverts need. But um, HSPs need to find the right amount of stimulation, not too much and not under stimulation. And if you are an extrovert, if you don't have enough stimulation, you can end up feeling depressed, lethargic, tired. And so I take this time to replenish and it just made me feel kind of um, even more unplugged and I couldn't figure out what the heck was wrong with me. And um, until I found out I was an HSP, I labeled a lot of my moods as being depressed. And I really started thinking about, um, 
excuse me, thinking about like, am I depressed? It's like, no, I'm just feeling depleted and I'm not feeling like I want to be around people. And so again, this is where the languaging and understanding about ourselves is so important that I have times when I feel very, what I, what I like to call expansive. So right now I'm in an expansive place. A lot of my energy is going out. I'm wanting to connect. I feel really good about kind of being out there. Probably tonight or tomorrow, I'm going to pull back in because this is a big energy expenditure for me. I, I like it. And uh, HSP extroverts, um, there's a term called wired and tired. So, you know, we go out in the world, we expend a lot of energy, and then we come home and we can't wind down because we're so wound up. So I tend to not go and do stuff at night because I come home so amped up that I can't go to sleep. And I need a good hour or two before I'm really ready to fall asleep. I get in bed, I allow myself about an hour to unwind once I'm in bed. So these are other ways that we learn to care for ourselves. If you go to um, hsperson.com and uh, search for extrovert, there's an article that I think Jackie Strickland wrote. Julie, do you know for sure? I think it's Jack Jackie Strickland's article that talks about HS extroverts. And so um, do you identify yourself as more of an introvert or an extrovert because it's it's really different and once I realized I was an extrovert it really helped me see my need for connection and I kind of hate to say it but social media is a great way for me to get that feel of connection with people without getting too drained and you know it's like if I've had enough of somebody I can just go like oh, I'm busy and I gotta go where when we do in-person stuff there's so much more stimulation even on the phone sometimes. So for me, social media has been a great way for me to get that sense of connection with people, but being able to pull back when I've had enough. Um, so Marley says, I can notice a change in tone of voice and it makes me want to shut down. So, oh, with other people. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think other people aren't even aware that it's going on for them. Oral says, dang, now I know where that comes from. Ha ha, thanks for that. Rachel says, yes, feels, uh, I feel so much stronger just since finding this group. We've got to have our tribe. And this is just a great group to um, connect with other people. Julia says she's an HSP extrovert, so you relate to that. All right, guys, it is, Julie says this might be the article. Yep, I think that that's it. Thank you, Julie. Ah, I'm so glad you're here. So glad everybody was here. All right, guys, thank you so much for tuning in and for participating today. I hope this has been helpful. Um, share in the comments, um, let's see, what would be helpful is, um, you know, if you guys are interested in doing a Zoom group, I need to think about if that's going to work for me. I'm talking before I think about it. You're welcome, Rachel. Um, please, you're welcome, Patricia. Please feel free to leave comments of other things that you want addressed. Um, if you're open to doing a Zoom group, you know, and I don't have to be the one that facilitates it. Maybe somebody else wants to take it up, but maybe that's another option. Any questions, comments that you've got, that would be great. Um, if you're watching this after the live and you've got questions or comments, please um, put them down and I will do my best to respond. Um, Oral says, yep, thanks a lot. Julie says, love this. Thank you for doing this. Thanks so much for showing up, everybody. This was really um, a fun experience, a little nervousing for me. But um, it was nice being here and sharing with you. And thank you all for showing up and taking your time today. Thanks, Randall. All right, have a great one. I'm going to sign off right now. And then, um, Donna, can you hold up taking the office admin for maybe 10, 15 minutes? I want to see if I'm able to share this to my page. And then, so it's 2, 3, so maybe um, 3, 15, 6, 15 your time. Can you change my status? All right, thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye.